I was born in October of 1980, just outside of Chicago. I was a happy, healthy baby girl with a vagina. But inside, instead of having ovaries, a uterus, and fallopian tubes, I had testes. I'm intersex, but more about that later. My parents, Georgia and George, named me their second child, George Ann. They're not the most creative. <laughs> Fortunately, they named my brother Nick and not George. <laughs> I was a flower girl three times when I was younger. And by the third time, I got really good at flinging flowers down the aisle. I was so good at it that just last year, my friends asked me to be the flower girl at their wedding. I lost the dress, but I kept the charisma. As a child, I tried really hard to be the cool kid. I often popped my collar and would wear sunglasses. It would have helped if I had better haircuts. Can't have it all. I loved collecting cabbage patch dolls and stuffed animals. After a long day at school, I would come home and reteach my dolls and stuffed animals everything I had learned. I loved being their teacher. I myself, well, I wasn't the best student, as evident by my second grade report card. <laughs> But things got better. I was Macbeth in my sixth grade middle school play. When I was auditioning for a role, the director asked me, What role do you want? Pointing to the audition sign, I said, well, it's Macbeth, right? So Macbeth, why wouldn't I want the lead? I got the role. Truth be told, I wasn't some sort of gender rebel in middle school. I thought Macbeth was a woman's character. <laughs> It all worked out, though. I got my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and eventually my PhD. And by the time I got to my PhD, I realized that I could take a photo in my cap and gown Without the cap, I look so much better. I even said yes to the dress and got married to a great man. And then a few years later, we amicably divorced. It all worked out, though. But you know, along the way, I was diagnosed with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, an intersex trait. It happened when I was about 13 years old. I was outside running with my friends, and my brother and his friends, and I was experiencing abdominal pain. My mother thought I was getting my period, so she brought me into the house. When that wasn't what was happening, she got concerned, so she rushed me to the urgent care center. There, what they discovered was that that abdominal pain that I had, well, that was from being out of shape and running around, and you know, <laughs> I know some of you can relate. But in the process of discovering that nothing was wrong with me, they did all sorts of medical imaging and x-rays, and that's when they learned that I had testes inside. And then, a few years after that, I had surgery to remove those testes. But the doctors didn't tell me at any point what they were removing. They didn't tell me I'm intersex. Instead, they told me I had cancer. I didn't discover the truth until I obtained my own medical records as an adult, a few years after that surgery. Imagine my surprise when I read through the redacted text of my medical records that I had testicles. I was so shocked and confused. And then as I continued reading my medical records, I learned that my testes, well, they weren't malignant. There was no cancer. Now, I know what you might be thinking. So what? You're a girl, they took out your testes, and there wasn't cancer. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because testes, like ovaries, produce sex hormones in the body. And sex hormones do a lot of different things for people. And one of the things t they do is sort of help with your bone health. So I was reading my medical records. I felt like a freak. I felt abnormal. Why did doctors lie to me? Why didn't they tell me the truth about my body and my experiences? And why did my parents go along with their lies? 
It's a good thing I didn't fall from the dizziness because I also read in my medical records that I had osteopenia. Means I have brittle bones. I was frustrated. I was very, very frustrated. But that frustration turned into curiosity. And I was, as I was sitting in a doctoral feminist sociology class, reading sociocultural scholarship on intersex, I knew that an intersex community existed when I thought I was the only intersex person in the world. I just needed to find them. And that's what I did. In the summer of 2008, I found my way into the AIS DSD support group, one of the largest intersex support groups in the world. There, I learned that intersex people, we share commonalities around being lied to about our bodies, about our diagnoses, and we're subjected to medically unnecessary and irreversible interventions. I wanted to bridge at that moment, my personal experience with intersex with my professional passion in understanding gender inequalities. And that bridge evolved into my book, Contesting Intersex, The Dubious Diagnosis. In my book, which is based on 65 in-depth interviews with intersex people, their parents, and medical experts, I explored the ways in which intersex is experienced defined and contested in contemporary U.S. society. And sadly, what I learned is that not a lot has changed since I was little George Ann. But what I also found out is that intersex people exist around the world. They're not abnormal. We are not abnormal. We are just like everyone else, with good days, with bad days, with good hairstyles, with bad hairstyles, we are not rare. Now, some people ask me, how common is intersex? And the truth is, we don't have any good, reliable estimates of intersex in the population. But what we do know is intersex is common enough that there are people connected all over the world and on the internet. So what I want you to know from my personal experience and from my research is that gender is fluid and not correlated with sex. What does that mean? It means that what's between our legs doesn't dictate the clothes we wear or the hairstyles we have. I also want you to know that lying to people about their diagnosis can cause shame. I want you to know that medically unnecessary surgeries are harmful. And while doctors may not intend to cause harm, they may think that they are helping, well, their intent doesn't matter. What matters is the outcome, and it's not good. I also want you to know that intersex is only a piece of our life. For some people, it's a big part of who they are and how they identify. But for others, it's just a sliver of their everyday life experiences. I want to leave you here with one particular group of intersex people. A group of intersex people that embody the possibilities of a different world. And that is our intersex youth. Our intersex youth, most who are, whom are affiliated with Interact, are bravely sharing their experiences in their classrooms, with their teachers, with their peers. They're even going on shows like MTV. Oh, I wish I had them when I was Macbeth. <laughs> so, I'm not, not much has changed since I was little G. I don't have my balls anymore at least not literally. But I'm still a pepper, only now they call me Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>